This is the second video of the two lectures on the political philosophy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So in the first video, we discussed his, uh, the first discourse, the discourse on the sciences and the arts, in which he is extremely critical of the Enlightenment ideal of progress, especially moral progress, where he argued that actually the promotion and flourishing of the sciences and the arts helped actually increase and uh, create this new sense of love of the self, a more propra or a kind of a pride in which we uh, become envious of others and we actually create and cultivate and perpetuate a uh, bad kind of morality, which is self-centered in a negative way, as opposed to the natural amour de soi or just self-love where humans naturally naturally love themselves in terms of just wanting to ensure you know they survive and they love their own existence so they're you know self-interested beings in a like not a bad way and then we discuss a little bit of the beginning of the second discourse the discourse on the origins of inequality where we saw his uh, criticism of Hobbes how he argued that you know uh, human beings and actually in the state of nature were not uh, terrible, selfish beings, but instead actually in society they became those selfish beings that Hobbes described as in the state of nature. Now, how is it though that humans actually got out of the state of nature and into society whereby this immorality flourishes now, where we are kind of stuck? So this is what he discusses in the second part of the second discourse. And this is where we'll start to see as well, not just his disagreements with Hobbes, but his disagreement with John Locke in the origin of uh, civil society, property, and government. So I want to read actually uh, this first paragraph from that uh, second part of the second discourse. So Rousseau writes, the first person who, having enclosed a plot of ground, thought of saying, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the true founder of civil society. What crimes, wars, murders, what miseries and horrors would the human race have been spared by someone who, pulling up the stakes or filling in the ditch, had cried out to his fellow humans, beware of, uh, beware of listening to this imposter, you are lost if you forget that the fruits are everyone's, and the earth is no one's. But in all likelihood, things had already reached a point where they could no longer remain as they were. For the idea of property, depending upon many prior ideas, which could have arisen only successively, was not formed all at once in the human mind. A great deal of progress had to be acquired, transmitted, and increased from one age to the next before reaching this end point of the state of nature. Let us therefore start further back and try to bring together from a single viewpoint this slow succession of events and of knowledge in their most natural order. So part of this is where he, in the first discourse, discussed the origins of knowledge being actually in vanity and how they're not as noble as Enlightenment thinkers and pure as Enlightenment thinkers would have. We are seeing this here, of course, with him talking about the succession of events and of knowledge in their most natural order, where we first have this person who is separating themselves from others. So they're already appropriating things for themselves. Uh, now, before I get to the thing about property, where, of course, uh, there's already a disagreement with Locke, the first part of this already is fascinating, that he mentions there is something about uh, property which is the origin of society, but which is actually not something that already previously existed. And that, through the creation of civil society, actually as opposed to what Locke argued, which is that, well, it would be more peaceful and look out for our best interests, so therefore it's more rational. Rousseau argued, again reading this quote, what crimes, wars, murders, what miseries and horrors the human race had been spared if they had you know ignored the person who uh decided to say this plot of man uh, this plot of land is mine and not yours 
Because what Rousseau argues later on, uh, we'll see in the social contract, is that actually war could not have existed in the state of nature, because war is not a thing between human beings. It is an association among things that can only then exist between states once this appropriation has already been uh, determined legitimate by convention. But uh, specifically on the property, here what uh, Rousseau is saying that is contrary to Locke is that Locke said property is a natural right. And Rousseau is saying, no, actually, there was a whole succession of events that led up to then the idea and implementation of property and therefore the rights tied to it. That instead, property is something that, uh, yes, led to the creation of government, as Locke said, but that property was not prior to, uh, was, was not, uh, did not exist the same time that humans, you know, came into existence. It's not natural. It's more of uh, closer to a convention. And that it's something that at one point in time, once kind of wheels started turning, we could no longer turn back though. So we are indeed stuck with property as of course Locke uh, argued. And already you can probably tell that for Rousseau, the existence of uh, political and civil society is not going to be as nice as Locke. It's not necessarily as bad as Hobbes, but uh, it's definitely not uh, a pretty story, a pure story, shall I say, uh, an innocent, maybe rational story. Okay, so Rousseau writes, inequality derives its force and growth from the development of our faculties and from the progress of the human mind, and eventually becomes stable and legitimate by the establishment of property and laws. So how does inequality uh, come about? It actually comes about through government through the establishment and protection, actually, of property rights, which seems a little bit weird because in some way we would maybe think that, you know, especially with Locke, where Locke is saying, well, yeah, inequality could still, of course, exist in government, but that it's better for us to actually live in government than in the state of nature. But here Rousseau is painting a different picture uh, entirely, that inequality actually is not something natural, but it's something which has been artificially produced, but now course, which we are stuck with. We can't go back to this situation uh, of a, a general egalitarian uh, existence, we could say. So what were these steps? Well, the first step, Rousseau says, is that we had uh, first signs of invented wealth in the case of land and livestock, which are just simple means of existence. That, of course, human beings need things to survive, like food, and therefore, we know that the world is scarce of things like uh, minerals and food and livestock. So some people are going to have more than others. Second step, eventually we have inheritances. Goods and property can't be enlarged except at the expense of others, for which, of course, inheritance becomes very important. Because at some point in time, since there's a finite space on the earth, human beings really start coming in contact with one another. And now, while things might have seemed plentiful at one point in time, now we're realizing, well, we all kind of want the same things. And now, well, if you have all the stuff that's good that I need to survive, well, this isn't good for me. So the third step, those who were left out were obliged to take from the rich who closed up all livelihood. So Rousseau starts pointing out we could call the enclosure of this concept of the commons. And that you have, uh, as opposed to a kind of communal, uh, but more anarchic, free lifestyle of, in, in the state of nature, where you just take whatever you need. Now you can't necessarily take what you need because it has been appropriated and closed off by certain groups of people. But once that happens, well, you're just, you know, your only resort is, of course, to steal from those who have. So the fourth step, the rich understood, of course, the disadvantageous prospect of perpetual war. They were outnumbered. 
there were going to be few who had more and many who had less. And of course, if you have less or, you know, almost nothing or nothing indeed, well, what else do you have to lose? But of course, then just take from the rich. And we know, of course, through natural disasters as well, this is going to uh, increase inequality of this kind. So this leads to the fifth step. The rich conceived a specious plan to, quote, use the very strength of those who attacked him in his favor, to make his defenders out of his adversaries, to instill different maxims in them, and to give them different institutions that were as favorable to him as natural right was adverse to him. So instead of, in the case of, of course, Hobbes, where, well, you know, the, the government comes about by people out of their own self-interest, recognizing we need to submit to someone powerful who's going to keep us safe, or just some powerful person who comes along and just coerces us into uh, submitting to his authority. Or in the case of Locke, where Locke argued, well, we all rationally see that it's in our best interest to unite uh, with this social contract uh, together and form a government. Rousseau was saying, no, it was actually in the best interest of the rich to swindle and con the masses. Because again, and this is something, again, very different from Locke, property is not something natural. There is no justice for property. There is no kind of moral understanding that, well, of course, this is mine and it should be defended. Because in this state of nature, there originally was not that until through, we could say, processes which uh, spontaneously, inevitably came about, then you have, of course, uh, the establishment of property, of which then those who have more recognize, well, hold on, if there's a lot that don't have all these resources that I have, and they outnumber me, maybe I need some kind of an institution to preserve what's in my best interest, my property. So how exactly did this happen? Well, as Rousseau writes, uh, and here in his uh, um, colorful, uh, really fantastic writing, he says, let us, so this is basically the plan of, uh, of the rich person, uh, you know, the, the, the way in which they would convince the masses to submit to some form of government, uh, rule by government. So, quote, let us unite, he tells them, to protect the weak from oppression, restrain the ambitious, and secure for each the possession of what belongs to him. Let us institute rules of justice and peace to which all are obliged to conform, which make no exception for anyone, and which compensate, as it were, for the whims of fortune by subjecting the powerful and the weak alike to mutual duties. In a word, instead of turning our forces against ourselves, let us gather, uh, let us gather them together into a supreme power that governs us according to wise laws, that protects and defends all the members of the association, repulses common enemies, and maintains everlasting concord among us. So, of course, I, I, I'm sure you see what's happening here. Rousseau is saying, well, of course, the rich tricked the poor, the masses, into submitting to some kind of authority by saying, look, you know, maybe you have a tiny little bit. Well, you don't want that gone, do you? Because what would you do without it? Meanwhile, of course, they're saying that knowing, well, I've got a whole lot, actually. And for me to lose mine is much worse than for you to lose yours. But you don't know that. And I'm telling you, hey, I'll protect you. Right? And, of course, think of feudalism. Rousseau is probably in some way influenced by feudalism, where you have uh, the Lord who protects uh, all the peasants who then agree to work the land and, of course, give some of uh, the, the goods that they uh, farm to the Lord. And, of course, it's, you know, to some degree we say, well, of course, it's in the best interest of the peasants. But, of course, who ends up, in the case of feudalism, uh, ransacking most of the time? Well, it's other lords that are actually doing it, and most of the time it's not actual common uh, people. But Rousseau is very... Um, I would say real about this, and to some extent cynical. So about this, he writes, All ran toward their chains, believing they were securing their freedom. 
For while they had enough reason to sense the advantages of a political establishment, they did not have enough experience to foresee its dangers. Because of course, well, yeah, if we unite together, then sure, maybe we can help one another. And of course, uh, we're stronger together in numbers as opposed to being individuals. But as he's saying, and as I mentioned before about all the war and uh, horrors that would result, the people in the state of nature could not have foreseen that they were, uh, as Rousseau says, uh, running toward their chains, willingly submitting to their masters. So, on the one hand, someone might think, well, then it seems obvious if government is established based on a lie, well then, we need to return to our real freedom before uh, government came about, and return to the state of nature. And to some extent, uh, this um, e e political ideology known as anarcho-primitivism is a little bit like that. Um, but on the other hand, Rousseau says no, actually. It is impossible for human beings to return to the state of nature, even though political society was built on a lie, and even though we have all these horrors that now exist, right? So this is part of the uh, paradoxical nature of Rousseau's philosophy. This is part of what makes him fascinating in that he is one of, I would say, the great uh, anti-enlightenment enlightenment philosophers. So he writes, once people are accustomed to masters, they are no longer capable of doing without them. If they try to shake off the yoke, they move all the further away from freedom, since mistaking freedom for unbridled license uh, that is opposed to it, their revolutions almost always deliver up seducers who only make their chains heavier. And of course, uh, we know, just looking at history and experience, that in many cases where there are revolutions where people uh, seriously do try to uh, bring about greater freedom and, you know, and equality and liberty for themselves, they end up creating a power vacuum and giving way to some uh, you know, dictator. Look at in the case of the French Revolution, which gave way to Napoleon Bonaparte. Look in the case of the Weimar Republic in Germany, which gave way to Adolf Hitler. Uh, and even, of course, Plato and Aristotle write uh, in the ways in which they argue democracy inevitably uh, turns into tyranny because at some point in time, uh, political society in, in a democracy, Aristotle and Plato argue, becomes dysfunctional. And so they look to someone who says, hey, I can bring about order. And they end up, you know, enslaving themselves, basically, uh, to that person. So, and, and there is something else interesting about here that, again, once people are accustomed to masters, they are no longer capable of doing without them. That's, uh, and, and Rousseau talked about this before, where he we were examining side by side human beings in the state of nature and human beings in political civil society. And there was one argument Rousseau made that when you know take for the case of technology, uh, and I'm sure we can relate to this I think really well. We become so reliant on technology, which in certain ways become our masters because of this that we are no longer capable of living without them, right? It's very hard when we become accustomed to things already being kind of simple for us to do, to do without them in ways that yes, technology improves our lives and in other ways, it diminishes other certain aspects of our lives. And we'll see next time with Immanuel Kant, uh, what he has to say about this uh, problem of throwing off the yoke of uh, as Rousseau says, our masters. So what do we do then? Well, we seem to be stuck where, again, government based on a lie, we've given up our freedom, and yet we can't return to the state of nature. So what do we do? Well, this is where we turn to the social contract, uh, Rousseau's book uh, called The Social Contract, not necessarily, not just the, the social contract uh, theory. Now, Rousseau says that the overriding question of his text, The Social Contract, is how to find a form of association that defends and protects 
the person and goods of each associate with all the common force, and by means of which, uniting with all, nonetheless obeys only himself and remains as free as before. Is it possible that there can be any legitimate and reliable rule in civil order? Can whatever this concept is that can make this possible, can it account for human nature? Can it join both what natural right permits and what is the common interest? Because, of course, to some extent, one might think individual liberties are at odds with what is in the common interest. And we often hear this, I think, uh, in contemporary politics played out constantly about, well, one side's about protecting the individual and the other side's about protecting society and the community, and they're necessarily at odds with one another. Well, Rousseau wants to know, can whatever this concept is, if he can develop it, can it ensure that justice and utility, that what is right and what is useful, conventional expedient, are not at odds with one another? This is clearly a tall order, and this is to some extent maybe a bit paradoxical, but again, as I've been saying, this is part of uh, what's really fascinating about Rousseau and, and his uh, paradoxical uh, philosophy. So, let's get into it. Let's see what this might be. So, Rousseau begins with this argument of the right of the stronger. And, of course, this is what Hobbes basically argues for, is that, you know, that person who comes along and is able to subdue people to their will, if they, of course, provide peace and security, well, then they have a right, based on Hobbes' interpretation of the social contract, they have a right to rule over them. Is that true? Is there such a thing as the right of the stronger? Is it the case that a government can exist legitimately just based on sheer, sheer force? So Rousseau asks this question of how does one actually maintain power once they have subdued someone to their will? How do, because we know in the one case, if I... Uh, let's say I came along and I, you know, I have a gun and I pointed the gun to your head. And I'm like, all right, you know, like lay down on the ground and stay there and don't move. And if you move, I'm going to shoot you. And, you know, so just stay there and you won't die. Well, to some extent, it is in your best interest to not die. So you lay there. So as long as then I have that force, that power of you, that threat that I can kill you, then... I'm, uh, you are subdued to my will. But does that always last? Right? Of course, what happens if then for a moment I turn the gun away? Well, because since I subdued you, does that mean I then have the right that you always shall do what I say? Even when I'm not presently threatening you with your life? Rousseau says, the stronger is never strong enough to be forever the master unless he transforms his force into right and obedience into duty. So how does this happen? Or is it even possible that one who is a conqueror, let's say, and they come and uh, conquer a city, how is it possible that they can turn their force over those people into a right to rule them, to where they have an, uh, a duty to obey? So, simply, does might make right? While well, Rousseau says again to this, what is a right that perishes when force ceases? Because, of course, if something is a right, doesn't it still remain a right, even if no one is threatening you? Don't I have a right to my life, even when no one is coming along and threatening other people to not kill me? Right? In that case, you know, say like, uh, uh, you know, if we want to try to imagine what this would be like, it would be, well, I only have a right to my life so long as someone more powerful, or even maybe me myself, right, has guns pointed at everyone. But the second I don't have guns pointed at them, well, then I don't have a right to my life. Now, we might, of course, say, well, I'm risking my life. But would we say, well, once I no longer have that force, that I don't have a right to my life? Well, Rousseau says, 
If one must obey due to force, there is no need to obey to duty. And if one is no longer forced to obey, one is no longer obligated to do so. It is clear, therefore, that this word right adds nothing to force. That there is, of course, nothing necessary in this idea of uh, right and force, which says they go together, which says necessarily then that once someone has coerced someone else, they then therefore have a right over them. Because we know that uh, there is nothing lasting that has to do with that. That force is always something temporary. But of course, right is not necessarily so. It can be temporary based on uh, maybe the conventional institution, right? Like let's say you have, uh, 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 let's say like a, uh, the right of a patent, but it only lasts so long, right? And then you have to renew it or something like that. Um, but in that case, we would still say, of course, you still have the right to the patent, even if you don't have a gun pointed to everyone's head, where if they make the same, you know, um, invention you have, that then therefore uh, you'll kill them, right? Even if you're not doing that, you still, we would say, have a right to, of course, uh, that patent, because there's something about the word right that transcends simple force. If that were the case, then as Rousseau uh, tackles, then right would uh, be associated with slavery. So let's think about this. If people have natural rights, like the right to life, and if it were the case that somehow right and force went together, well, let's imagine this then relating force when we subdue someone in the act of then enslaving them. Let's relate this to then this question of can a person sell themselves into slavery? Is it possible? Is it logically? Now, we wouldn't say, uh, of course, can someone actually do it? You know, I could literally walk to someone, uh, let's say the institution of slavery is legal and exists somewhere, and I, I walk up to them and I'm like, enslave me, and they're like, okay. Well, sure, technically I could do that. But is it actually based on those concepts of right, freedom, liberty, authority, slavery, all those different concepts, is it logically coherent that a person can sell themselves into slavery? Well, of course, what does slavery mean? Well, it means that you have no right to do as you please. You have no freedom. And we don't just mean freedom in the negative sense of negative liberty, the, the freedom, of course, from uh, external force and constraints, but you also don't have any kind of positive uh, liberty. You don't have the ability to like, oh, hey, I want to walk down the street and go get a coffee. And let's say if we were in the pandemic and we could, you know, just go do that and send a coffee shop. Uh, you don't. And maybe that's a good question about uh, us being in the pandemic. Have we sold ourselves into slavery since maybe we could be arrested for going to the coffee shop? Um, but <laughs> uh, when you are enslaved, right, you can't just choose to do that for yourself. Someone else does that for you. But of course, to freely and willingly sell yourself into slavery would mean you have used freedom to negate itself. Is it possible to negate your own freedom? Well, let's think about this other question. Can a people sell themselves into slavery as a whole, as a, a population, as in the, you know, many, uh, in many cases people think is the case with government, that in government people do sell themselves uh, into slavery by submitting to this uh, entity which does have a monopoly, of course, on force. But what about their children and future generations? Can you sell your future children into slavery? In other words, do you have a right to do so? And this is a very important question because, of course, if it is the case that with the government, if the government has a monopoly on force, well, the social contract says and of course, again, as I mentioned before, none of us signed the social contract. The social contract says the government has a right to 
govern over you, to tell you, hey, right now, you can't gather together in large public spaces. But none of us signed this social contract. So, of course, we're starting to see there's a problem, maybe, with this concept of the social contract that was established. And Rousseau intends to see if he can solve this problem. Because it is contradictory that one could willingly, freely sell themselves into slavery. Because you would effectively, if we just look at the simple logic, you would be negating your own freedom. But the only way to do that would mean you have the freedom to do that. And if you have then given up your freedom, then you don't have the freedom to do that. So, to answer the question, no, it is not possible that a person can sell themselves into slavery. It is not possible a people can sell themselves into slavery, much less uh, those that the, the children and future generations of that people. So, in turning to war, which of course has existed throughout all of uh, human history, according to Rousseau, post the state of nature, and which all governments essentially, uh, we could say, have come about through, is there a right to enslave a person through conquest? Well, Rousseau says, a slave made through war is in no way committed to his master, except to obey him insofar as he is forced to do so. Thus, from whatever vantage point one looks at things, the right of slavery is null and void, not only because it is illegitimate, but because it is absurd and meaningless. These words slavery and right are contradictory. So, are freedom and authority then contradictory? Because, of course, if a government exists, well, it has a certain amount of authority. But, you can't just give up your freedom to government because, as Rousseau just established, it's contradictory. It's impossible to actually, to willingly submit to give up your freedom. So how can we rationalize government then? Is there a way to rationalize government? Well, Rousseau says, freedom and authority are not necessarily contradictory if one submits to the authority of one's own will. Now, it's maybe much, uh, uh, maybe on the surface that doesn't sound so profound, but actually this has uh, far wide re reaching consequences. So again, freedom and authority are not necessarily contradictory if one submits to the authority of one's own will. What he's saying is, if I choose, because I have rationally calculated, hey, it's better for me right now to uh, study as opposed to playing video games because I want to do such and such later, well, should I actually do what I used my own rational thought to figure out what I want to do, should I actually follow through with it? Rousseau says, of course that's not contradictory. If that were the case, then we can never use reason to determine what would be in our best interest. We could never actually follow through with our own plans. And that would be entirely absurd. So, can a political community then if it is possible, right, that you can submit to authority out of your own will, so you can freely submit to your own authority, follow your own commands, can a political community then submit to the authority of their own will? What would be required for that? Because now we're taking the, the leap from one individual saying, well, they're going to follow uh, their use of reason to do with, you know, whatever it is uh, they have determined is in their best interest, and that's not contradictory, even though they're submitting to reason, what is rational. Can we then make that leap from individuals doing that to a community as a whole? Rousseau says yes. And this is where we see this famous concept of the general will. And this is the concept that is going to solve this problem of the social contract, it's going to solve this problem of how 
While government may have been founded on a lie, and while most governments, if not all governments, re in reality, uh, exist on the basis of coercion, Rousseau was trying to argue there can actually be a government which is based on reason and which is not contradictory, but which is uh, the creation of the will of the people themselves, in which they retain their full freedom, even though they submit to the authority of that government, because they're really just submitting to their own authority, their own will. So legitimate laws are founded on the general will of the citizens, such that the individual citizen living under the power of a state is only obeying their self as a member of the political community. Rousseau says, I say, therefore, that sovereignty, since it is nothing but the exercise of the general will, can never be alienated. You can never give up your um, freedom to choose what you want without external force, without external coercion. And that the sovereign, which is nothing but a collective being, can be represented only by itself. Power may well be transferred. You can give up your right to force, to you know, own a weapon or something like that. In which, in the case, of course, a, a government has a monopoly on the use of force. But Rousseau says you cannot transfer will. You cannot give up your own freedom. Now, there's a lot of uh, interesting caveats about this that you might not uh, immediately uh, think makes sense. For example. Rousseau argues that the particular will of individuals in a society may or may not actually be in agreement with the general will. That it is possible that whatever the general will is of a society, whatever is in the, the society's best interest such that they would all, you know, willingly choose this thing, um, you know, if they all sat down and rationally thought it out, that it might be possible actually that a few people disagree with that. Still, the general will exists, and we'll see why uh, in a moment. Secondly, the general will tends toward equality because, of course, it incorporates everyone. Everyone is uh, politically equal uh, in the state, at least in a legitimate state, uh, of course, because, again, legitimate laws are founded on the general will of the citizens. Um, but it is this equality is not continually lasting and is always voluntary. Rousseau says, If, then, the people promises simply to obey, it dissolves itself by this act. Then if you simply say, Sure, government, um, you know, I'll just do whatever you say is best. Then immediately that government is illegitimate. They have dissolved the act of which uh, government is legitimately founded. It loses, he says, its status as a people. The moment there is a master... There is no longer a sovereign. And from that point onward, the body politic is destroyed. So with the general will, there must constantly be this uh, uniting of interests such that uh, everyone is always uh, participating, but which it might be the case that not everyone always agrees and still what the government does is can be legitimate if it is indeed the general will. Because again, as we discussed, it is not contradictory for you to submit to your own will. And if the government is the representative of your own will, then it's not contradictory to submit to that. However, it's much more complicated than that. Because what exactly is the general will? How do you determine what is the general will? Rousseau doesn't give any, you know, mathematical formulas in, in, you know, by which we can determine what the actual uh, general will is. But there have been two main interpretations uh, by scholars uh, ever since Rousseau has argued this. The first is this idea of the abstract general will, which is kind of uh, the transcendent incarnation of the citizen's common interests that exists in, ab in abstraction from what any of them actually wants. As Rousseau says, one always wants what is good for oneself, but one does not always see it. There is often a considerable difference between the will of all and the general will. The latter considers only the common interest, while the former considers private interest and is merely a sum of particular wills. 
It should be understood from this that what generalizes the will is less the number of voices than the common interest that unites them. And think about this, there is probably a lot of merit to this that you would agree on. Take for the case of climate change. Well, a lot of people might think, well, it's in, of course, my best interest that I have a job and where I live. It's impossible for me to take public transportation, which could be uh, powered through non-fossil uh, fuel means. And I don't maybe, you know, uh, maybe I don't even know necessarily all the effects of climate change and the reality of which the science is telling us about it. But in my particular interest, well, I need to get to work because I need to live. Well, for most of society, at least in the United States, uh, we live in a world dominated by cars in the suburbs where we have to take cars. We have to continually um, emit more uh, carbon, uh, um, emit more carbon into the atmosphere, which of course, ultimately is not in our best interest because in the long run, it's gonna kill us. It's gonna bring down civilization. So in this idea of the abstract general will, even though none of us with our particular wills has come together and said, maybe we need to stop you know, driving cars or build more public transit or something like that, the general will might still say, well, uh, it is in our best interest to do such a thing like stop driving cars, make other means necessary where we can get to work, but which we might not all particularly agree with and it could still be the general will because it would transcend all our particular wills. Because, as Rousseau says, we don't always know what's in our best interest. The second interpretation of the general will is we could call the literal general will. So this would be what the citizens of the state have decided together in their sovereign democratic assembly. It would be them coming together, discussing the ideas of what they think are the best improvements to make, and then whatever they all uh, democratically agree on, that is the general will. As Rousseau says, for a will to be general, it is not always necessary for it to be unanimous, but it is necessary that all the votes be counted. Any formal exclusion destroys the generality. Now, of course, there are pros and cons to each, which is why there's this kind of dilemma about, well, which interpretation is correct? Well, in reality, because of the paradoxical nature of Rousseau's philosophy, they're both correct. Because think about the abstract general will. While it might technically be more correct in terms of, yes, uh, we should, you, you know, there are things out of our own control and there are things that we don't know about which we might be doing which hurt us. Think about where that can lead with a slippery slope. Well, maybe you just give over power to technocrats, all these smart people who are supposed to know really they study climate change and what's best for us. Well, that could easily descend into some kind of technocratic tyranny. But on the other hand, well, if we simply just say, well, let's get together and whatever we determine to be correct based on a democratic vote is correct and that's what we should you know, follow. Well, we know just because the majority agrees on something doesn't mean it's right or true. So we're left with this dilemma here uh, between these two interpretations of the general will. Um, I do want to read one more quote, though, about the general will here uh, from Rousseau. He writes, the, co the commitments that bind us to the social body are obligatory only because they are mutual, and their nature is such that in fulfilling them, one cannot work for someone else without also working for oneself. So, we have to keep in mind, always, 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 Rousseau wants to make it clear you cannot just give up then to the technocrats, but you can't just rely on, uh, you know, just simple democratic institution because they're not always actually going to bring about the general will, but you can't do without it either. So, how then do we put the general will into practice. Uh, this is where Rousseau is uh, less praised, we could say. Um, a lot of people don't like his answer here, but basically he argues, well, good and legitimate government varies, that there are many different types of government that you could have that could carry out the general will, that it's all based on context, he argues. So he says, 
As there is only one proportional mean for each ration, there is also only one good government possible in a given state. But as a thousand events can change these relations within a people, not only can different governments be good for various peoples, but they can be good for the same people at different times. What does that actually mean? Well, yes, it means at some times a monarchy might, uh, well, a constitutional, we should say, monarchy might be more appropriate. At other times, a constitutional democracy might be more appropriate. So you can have these extremes where he's saying, well, based on the context, might require these different forms of government. So uh, let's take the case of democracy here. So with democracy, the less people, the weaker executive power need be, because each has greater sovereign power than in a large-sized society. And that means we're each more accountable to one another, we're more likely uh, to know each other in a smaller society, and in that sense, democracy is more likely to flourish and, of course, bring about the general will. As he says, he who makes the law knows better than anyone how it should be executed and interpreted. However, a people that would never abuse government would not abuse independence either. A people that would always govern well would not need to be governed. So, of course, we can't just argue, well, of course, then, uh, maybe we don't need government if we could just have us all living collectively if democracy is possible in small spaces. And Rousseau is saying, no, because if that were the case, then we wouldn't need government in the first place. But we know because a more propra, this pride exists, it would inevitably again lead to coercion. So we do need some kind of rational government. Then let's look at aristocracy. Medium-sized societies require less executive power than a single prince, but they, of course, do require more than a democracy. So as Rousseau says, in a word, the best and most natural order is for the wisest to govern the multitude, as long as it is certain uh, that, they will, that they will govern it for its advantage and not for their own. But it must be noted that the corporate interest begins here to direct the public force less in accordance with the general will. And that another inevitable decline takes from the laws a portion of the executive power. That while, yes, as he's arguing in an aristocracy, or maybe we could think of a, a technocracy, yes, it would make sense that the wisest govern. But the problem is, in that case, as he says, the reality is you end up having corruption then that comes about. So again, there's always this trade-off. It's never perfect. And then in the case of monarchy, the larger the populace, the stronger the executive power need be. He says, while there is no government that is more vigorous than a monarchy, there is none which the particular will has greater sway and more easily dominates the others. Everything moves toward the same goal. It is true. But that goal is not public felicity, and the very force of the administration constantly works to the detriment of the state. That yes, in a monarchy, of course, in a giant centralized government, um, it might actually uh, work well in executing laws, especially in the case of, take a pandemic, it's very good to have centralized authority in a pandemic. Having multiple states in, you know, like, let's take the United States, Having multiple governors decide what they want to do on how to handle a pandemic doesn't efficiently help tackle the pandemic because, of course, while one state, let's say like Kentucky, for example, takes stricter measures and so helps combat the coronavirus better, maybe a state like Tennessee is like, hey, well, I'll just leave it up to the mayors. But then maybe that means, of course, people end up being more free and they associate when they shouldn't. And that, of course, based on how diseases work, is going to bleed over into Kentucky. And so you're not actually able to efficiently deal with the uh, pandemic. But on the other hand, you risk yourself of greater authority and the risk, of course, of eventually your freedom being taken away where the general will is no longer followed. So there is no perfect answer here that Rousseau thinks he can give. It's just based on the context and it constantly is something that the people have to watch over and be mindful of that uh, the state never strips away their uh, freedom 
and it, that it always acts according to the general will. Now here again, uh, as we have seen throughout all of this, um, Rousseau, I, I would say he's a pessimist, um, but he is certainly not some optimist, of course, again, him being uh, an anti-enlightenment, enlightenment thinker. Uh, he doesn't think that we can just use reason and then, you know, the best things will happen and we'll have a perfect existence. That's impossible. And the reason why, again, goes back to that original formation of the state, it being based on a lie. That is, in a sense, a kind of original sin of which we can never do away with because we can never do away with pride. That moral quality which uh, permeates throughout civil society in which we can never get rid of because it is, as Rousseau tried to argue, the basis of civil society. So, he says, under bad governments, Political equality is only apparent and illusory. It serves only to keep the poor man in his misery and the rich man in his, in his usurpation. In fact, laws are always useful to those who have possessions and harmful to those who have nothing. It follows from this that the social state is advantageous for men only insofar as they all have something and as none of them has too much. But is it possible that we can have this ideal state of existence of a government where all has something but none has too much? Well, you probably already guessed for Rousseau, the answer is no. That instead, actually, there is an uh, innate tendency of government to degenerate. That always, because this power exists in the state, it always constantly moves towards the usurpation of uh, the legitimacy of its existence. So the social contract then is broken either by, Rousseau says, contraction or dissolution. In the case of contraction, he says, the moment the government usurps sovereignty, the social co the compact is broken, and all ordinary citizens, returned by right to their natural freedom, are forced, but not obligated, to obey. So that is when and you no longer have the right of authority, but instead it's just pure coercion. And then secondly, there's the case of dissolution. He says, when the state dissolves, any abuse of government whatsoever takes the general name anarchy. Because in that case, then there is no more uh, rational uh, authority given to that government. And it's just, uh, in the case of Rousseau, the way he's using the word anarchy here, it is chaos. So... He says, the body politic, just like the body of man, begins to die right from the moment of its birth and carries within itself the causes of its destruction. That there are, Rousseau is basically arguing, because of this original sin of uh, humans emerging out of the state of nature and government being built on a lie, and of which these institutions being then built on uh, pride, this amor propria, that civil political society contains these necessary internal contradictions of which always they will uh, uh, dissolve and degenerate and, and corrode from the inside out. And that means constantly then if people must, if they want to maintain the general will, of course revolt every now and then um, when that begins to happen. There is a little bit of optimism here, and to see it, I want to go back to where we started, and that is with the first discourse, the discourse on the sciences and the arts. So, Rousseau writes, as long as power is by itself on the one side, enlightenment and wisdom by themselves on the other, the learned will rarely think of great things. Princes will even more rarely do noble things, and people will continue to be abject, corrupt, and unhappy. But of course that means, well, as Rousseau has tried to argue, maybe it doesn't necessarily have to be the case that power and enlightenment have to be on opposite sides. That maybe, and of course it is difficult, the two can come together and rash, there can be a rational form of government which uh, is not based on coercion. So, in considering now 
uh, Rousseau's political philosophy, here's, I think, a really interesting discussion question. Is Rousseau's political philosophy more totalitarian or more libertarian? And before you think about that, consider this quote on page 175. So Rousseau writes, Therefore, in order for the social compact not to be an empty formality, it tacitly encompasses the following commitment, which alone can give force to the rest. That whoever refuses to obey the general will will be constrained to do so by the whole body, which means nothing else but that he will be forced to be free. That that person who uh, wants to resist what the general will is, what is in the best interests of society, that person must be forced to be free, forced to obey the general will. But of course, technically, as Rousseau is arguing, well, it's really what that person would rationally want anyways. For such is the condition that, by giving each citizen to the fatherland, guarantees him against all personal dependence. A condition that makes for the ingenuity and the functioning of the political machine, and that alone makes legitimate civil engagements, which would otherwise be absurd, tyrannical, and liable to the most enormous abuses. So while, of course, Rousseau has introduced this concept of the general will to uh, reconcile freedom and authority and show that you can still be free and live in political society, does that actually also make possible, then, uh, wide-ranging, uh, legitimate force against individuals who maybe conscientiously ob object to um, the general will? Does Rousseau, for example, make civil disobedience um, illegitimate? What do you think? 